Good morning and welcome to Calvary. Let's stand and let's sing together.
may be seated. Well, good morning and happy Easter to everybody here. Glad to have you guys here this morning. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are so glad that you are here with us this morning. Um, let me just say this. If this is your first time uh, with us, if this is maybe your first time even coming into a church, this is what it's all about. This is what's all what you sung, the energy that you felt in our singing. Th- this is a group of people here that, that you've walked in with here that, that are not perfect, have not figured life out, and, and we're the pinnacle of everything and wish everybody else was more like us. We're a broken group of people who have been loved and, and reconciled with, with the God of the universe not because of anything that we have done, not because of how good we tried to live, but because Christ lived a perfect life for us, died, and what we celebrate today, that he is risen. So this, this is what you've walked into, and we celebrate that this morning. So we're glad that you're here with us this morning. Hope you feel welcomed and loved. And, and, and again, I want to invite you guys at the end of this service, if you have any questions, if you want to know who we are as a, as a ministry, what we're about, what this church thing is about, there's a guest information table in the front lobby here, right out those doors, where, where Josh, our senior pastor, he'll be there at the end of the service to meet with you, to talk with you, to answer any questions that you may have. There's information, there's a free gift that we'd love to give you as well. But again, thank you for joining us. All of you, thank you for joining with us on this Easter sunny Sunday. Um, it's just a great time to worship and celebrate Christ. One thing we want to ask all of you to do here, whether you've been here your entire life or this is your first Sunday here, is is take a moment and fill out this connection card in your bulletin. And and it's perforated. You can rip it right out and and you can fill all that out. We want everybody in this room today to fill that out. And so um, usually this time I start hearing the perforation, that's okay. Um, We want you to do that. And and as the offering comes later on in the service, please just throw that in. This is a way for us to connect with you, you to connect with us, a way for us to pray for you. Um, And so please, please take advantage of that and put that in the offering plate. One other thing that you found in your bulletin this morning was something called Building Community all summer long. We, we want to, this summer, really put a big emphasis, a big focus on, on community, on as a church family coming together and doing life together. So, so in this, you're going to see different things that are happening on Sundays and, and Wednesdays, kind of the calendar for the summer months. Um, every Sunday evening will be something different. Maybe we'll gather here together to, to have teaching on what community is and what biblical fellowship looks like. And then other times during the month, we'll have time to practice that out, be in people's homes, getting to know other people that maybe we don't know very well, but a way for us to just build that community. Uh, We might be taking summer or Sundays and we'll just go up to the acres up the street here and just eat and laugh and and, and play together. That's a good thing for us as a a church family to do. So so keep this with you. Um, Put it on your fridge, wherever it is that you uh, look at most often so you know what's coming up ahead of you this summer. So please take that. That'd be a huge help to us and to you as well as we look to, to to serve you here. Well, as we move forward, um, those of you guys that are regular attenders here, been here for, for, for many months, many years, uh, you know that this year started off uh, with tremendous challenge to our church. Uh, one of our pastors, Pastor Jerry, uh, became very, very sick, even to the point of, of near death. And, and we as a church gathered together and we prayed for him and we prayed for uh, his family and we prayed that God's will be done and that he, that he would heal him and, and, and praise God he's here with us this morning. God, God heard the prayers of his church. Yes. God heard our prayers. God heard the prayers of people all over, all over the country praying for him and for his family. And, and we praise God that he answered us. And, and, and as we were praying, we were praying that, man, God would just use this trial, use this challenge and to just get his name out. And, man, that's happened. And, and we're going to hear about that today. And so Jerry's going to come up and, and just share with us just what God has been doing through his life and his family's life and how God has even used um, what he has gone through to get God's name out there and how it's changed other people's lives. So he's going to come up here in just a moment right after this short video. Good morning. In Psalm 61, it says, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint, literally literally when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, 
a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For many of us in here, the last few days our hearts have been overwhelmed as one of our friends and one of our pastors has been in a hospital bed in ICU and we've been praying that the Lord spare his life. And so on a day like today, on a morning like this, we want to come together as a family and really we want to do what this psalm tells us to do. We want to be led to the rock that is higher than we are. And so this morning is going to be a little different than our regular services. The kids are going to stay in here and we're going to give even more time than normal to reading from the psalms and, and praying together and trusting the Lord right now as we, as we walk through this valley, as, as we come with hearts overwhelmed. We want to trust God. We want to follow God. We want God to sustain and strengthen us. And so this morning, we're going to do exactly what we're told here. We're going to go to Christ and find refuge in Him. Let me begin our time by praying together. Father, we come with hearts faint, with hearts overwhelmed. We come burdened with the care of one of the families in our church and one of our friends and one of our pastors. Our hearts come anxious and worried about Jerry and his health. We've been praying for him. We've been begging you to heal him. We've seen you already perform some miracles as he's still with us and you have preserved his life to this point. And so God, we we thank you. We pray this morning as we gather as your family, one of our brothers, one of our sisters is overwhelmed with grief and pain and suffering. We we call out to You and we cry to You and we say, God, we need Your help. We need Your strength. We need You to work. We need You to do what we cannot do. So I pray that as we gather that this will be a time of encouragement. It will be a time of hope. It will be a time of strength as we look to Christ. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Job 12.10 says this, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Job 33.4 says this, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. I stand here today only because of God and God alone. He spared my life. And um, a few weeks ago, Josh asked me to say a few things on Easter Sunday. And I want to say, first of all, that I am truly, uh, truly humbled. Um, I want to be so careful to make sure that everything I say points you to Jesus, not to me, but points you to Jesus. I do not want to get in the way of anything that he might do. Almost three months ago, Robbie took me to the hospital because I had the flu. I thought I had the flu. It was a Wednesday night and I felt horrible and she wanted to take me then and if you know anything about me in hospitals, they don't quite mix. So I said, if I'm not feeling better in the morning, we'll go. And uh, I was not doing well at all. I thought I had the flu because the flu was going around. When I got to the hospital, I couldn't even get out of the car. I actually sat on the feet of the wheelchair and they sort of drugged me and you would have thought I was a drunk as they were dragging me in. I don't remember anything. I, the, the last thing I remember was uh, climbing in the wheelchair and being told I was being taken to x-rays. Twelve days later, I woke up. Thirteen days later, I was able to communicate, though not very well. During those thirteen days, I was as good as dead. I did nothing. But I've come to find out that there was a lot going on. Over the past couple of weeks, I have had the opportunity to visit with my family and many friends, and each of them have shared bits and pieces of what happened while I was unconscious. My my dear wife was told that I would not live past noon on the following uh, Friday, the the next day. 
She was actually told I wouldn't make it through the night. And then she was told noon. And she asked the doctors to please keep me alive until um, all of the kids could get home. Um, and uh, she never left my side for thir 13 days. Never left. She uh, begged God to spare my life and give me another chance. And at the same time, the doctors were giving her a whole, no hope at all of that happening. My kids were uh, told by the doctors that their dad was probably not going to make it and uh, that I had a 5% chance of making it at best, but I would have complications. My siblings came to visit and say their goodbyes. Friends came and others from all over the world called to talk to Robbie or my kids to express their concerns and let them know that they were praying. My kids' friends flew in to be with our family and to uh, uh, comfort them. And then my church family, you guys, invaded the hospital. The ICU area was taken over totally by those of you that came. All the visiting rooms, extra rooms, the hallways, all those things. You came and you um, ministered to my family while I was unconscious. I don't think you, uh, I will ever be able to express how much that means to me and how much it meant to my family. Um, meals, cards, flowers, phone calls, texts, emails, tons of food, and I heard it was good food, and I missed it. <laughs> of course, it was the good food that got me to where I was. We don't have to agree that much with that, but the, <laughs> the stories that my family has uh, shared with me have been overwhelming and extremely humbling. Friday noon came and went, and God saw fit to spare my life. He did not take me yet. The doctors on multiple occasions told Robbie that this is not good. What's happening right now is not good, and they were waiting for the other shoe to drop. They anticipated that my heart and my lungs would give out. Saturday, January 25th, you dedicated the day to praying for me and my family. Then Sunday, January 26th, you set aside the morning service to pray for me, my wife, my kids, and you worshiped. And that's what you saw at the beginning here, was the beginning of that service. And I have uh, watched that uh, video several times. I watched it from the hospital after I came to. Watched it from my hospital bed. I've watched it several times since. And I just want to share a few things with you about what took place in that service and what has taken place in me as a result of what took place in that service. Pastor Josh opened the service reading Psalm 61, as you saw in the video. And he asked God that he would lead you to the rock. You then sang some songs of, wor of praise and worship. Pastor Matt read Psalm 23 and shared how God used the phrase, he restores my soul to speak to him over and over again. You'll remember as he was talking that morning, it wasn't the doctor's reports, it wasn't the, the various things that said, oh, there's some progress here, oh, he squeezed my hand when I said something that was bringing hope. The thing that uh, Matt shared with us is the thing that was bringing hope was the fact that Psalm 23 says, He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. God did that. Then Pastor Wingate came and read Psalm 139. Wherever, wherever I go, wherever I find myself, you are there. Pastor Wingate and I have often talked about the sovereignty of God. And uh, all, all these years that I've been with him, I've been planning his funeral, but he was planning my funeral that weekend. But God's sovereign. And uh, he spoke of that and he shared that. And Brian Jackson came and prayed and asked God to be glorified. He, of course, he asked God that he would, he would spare my life. But I remember the emphasis of Brian's prayer was this, God be glorified. In all of this, whatever takes place, be glorified. Then Matt Knobloch came. And I remember Matt praying and he said that he boldly asked God for a miracle. God, we're not playing around here. We are boldly asking you for a miracle. And Laura Thomas sang the song, Not for a Moment, speaking of the faithfulness and sovereignty of God. Then Josh read and taught that morning from Romans 8, 28 and 29. And he said that he told you three things that this passage said about me as a Christian while I lay unconscious in the hospital bed. The first thing it said 
is that I will be glorified one day. Someday, not knowing when, thinking it might have been that day or the next day, but that I will be glorified one day. He said that I will be accepted by Almighty God because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of what we celebrate today, I will be accepted by Almighty God. His wrath is appeased. Redemption is settled. It's all taken care of. Just waiting for me to get there. The third thing he said is I will never be separated from the love of God. Never. Regardless of where I may find myself, regardless of what I may be doing, I will never be separated from the love of God. He then went on to talk about the impact that this experience would have on me if I were to make it through. He said that I will better understand the love of Jesus and be more like him. I, I, um, I don't know how to fully express that. But when God takes you on a journey like that, you, um, you go much deeper with God and you begin to have a, a knowledge of Jesus and what he has done for you that you've never had before. He said that, um, he talked about the ripple effects beyond me, the effects on my family. My, uh, my wife, I, I, I jokingly say this, I used to be the head of my household, but now my wife is. Because I put her through something that wives don't deserve to go through. So I might express my opinion, but you know who wins now? She does, and I gladly submit. Right, I gladly submit. <laughs> the impact it would have on the hospital staff. I, um, on several occasions, hospital staff would come in and say, you are a miracle. There's absolutely no medical explanation for you being alive. You're a miracle. But you know what was cool is what they said about our church family. They said, we've never seen anything like that. There were people praying everywhere. There were people talking all over the place. There were people who were here. There were people who came in every day at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning just to pray for me. You have no idea how much that means. You have no idea the impact it had on the hospital staff as they saw you praying there. I remember uh, Robbie telling me about the hospital staff watching through the windows. They removed the breathing tube from me. And as I began to breathe, they applauded. Because um, I, I wasn't supposed to make it. I wasn't supposed to be here. Our church, the, then Josh talked about the ripple effects on our church family and friends. Your acts of kindness were and continue to be overwhelming. You have no idea how much our family appreciates this. And all of this time, while I was unconscious, I missed it. I did nothing. There was nothing I could do. February 3rd, I came out of my state of unconsciousness and was able to breathe on my own. The nurse told my wife that I had the labs of a dead man. There's no reason why I should be alive. I remained in ICU for another seven days and was then moved to progressive care. I spent five days in progressive care and was then moved to acute rehab where I spent the next 19 days learning how to walk and to care for myself again. March 4th, I was released from the hospital and, and finally able to go home, but I was ordered to stay out of the public for another four weeks. And during that time, I lost 96 pounds. Marie Osmond has nothing on my weight loss program. <laughs> Mine's a little bit more expensive than hers, but mine worked. I continue in rehab today, and uh, I'm thankful to be able to do that. About three weeks ago, I had my one-month follow-up visits with seven different doctors, and every one of them said, you are a miracle, you should not be here. There's absolutely no medical reason why you are here. I said, it's obvious that there is a God who is looking out for you. Three of our doctors are believers, the other four are not. And we were thankful to be able to tell them, you know what, we are, I am a miracle. But I'm thankful for, uh, I told them God did this, but I'm thankful for the part they played in, in uh, helping me and, and uh, uh, doctoring me. Two weeks ago, Robbie and I visited ICU where I asked, where, as we walked in, I was asked, can I help you by uh, a couple of nurses there? And I said, no, you already have. And they said, what are you talking about? And then 
<coughs> excuse me, Robbie came from around the corner and they just burst into, you know, cheers and happiness and came and gave Robbie a hug because they couldn't believe that I was walking into uh, ICU. Um, I have visited acute rehab where I went through all the re re uh, rehab work and uh, uh, people are amazed and call me a, a miracle. I was going to rehab the other day and came across an, a custodian on the elevator who said, you're Jerry. You're the guy who was in ICU. You're the miracle. The custodian. Um, I'm overwhelmed and humbled. I can't say that enough. I went home Sunday night after the pageant and um, was laying in bed. And I was thinking about, you know, the pageant at the end of the Easter pageant, which was awesome. At the end of it, in the cardboard testimonies, there were three nights in a row where there was a standing ovation at the end as people testified to what God had been doing in their lives. I happened to talk to Sam and Sherilyn Baird. And I was talking to them the other day. I said, Sam, you know, I don't understand why God spared me and why he didn't spare Mike. And the very first thing Sherilyn said, Mike's work was done. Yours is not. Get busy. I don't know what God has in store. I don't know what he's going to do. But once again, I was overwhelmed and humbled, and I went home Sunday night after the pageant. I was laying in bed and wondering why all of this. Not, not complaining, but just wondering. The, Robbie and I have, have been told numerous and countless stories of how people have been impacted. There's people that are exercising now that never exercised before. There's people that are watching what they eat and doing something about it rather than just watching what they eat like I did and doing nothing about it. There's people who are, who are getting things right with other people. There are people who are, who are serious about their faith. But as I, was, as I went home, I, uh, I was wondering what was going on. I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I looked at my phone, and it said that I had a message on Facebook. And I don't spend too much time on Facebook. But I looked at it. It was written at 10.30 Sunday night from someone I did not even know. I want to read to you what that said. Dear Mr. Campice, we have never met, but I wanted to tell you a story of how your recent illness helped me to realize how much I needed to focus on the spiritual growth of myself and my family. My kids have been attending Awana this year here at Calvary, and my oldest daughter, Samantha, who is 10, occasionally attends Sunday evening services with the Jackson family, Brian and Bonnie and the kiddos. She also par uh, participated in the Easter pageant this year. One of the Sunday evening services she attended was I believe the Sunday after you fell ill. Bonnie and I had talked and I had, been, I had seen information about you being sick. So I had a talk with Samantha and let her know it would be a prayer service where they were praying for someone very special to them who was very sick. We talked about it and she went to the service. When she got home, we talked for a while. We cried and talked about how God has plans for people and we have to trust in him even when we don't understand. Every day she would ask what update I had read on Facebook and or CaringBridge. We'd talk and we'd pray that God would help you to get better, help your family and your church family during this time. We had so many conversations about how God can work miracles, how we need to trust that he knows what is best, and to see that situations are not always about us. They could be about God using our situation to help others. As we had these conversations, I realized that my relationship with God has been lacking. While years ago I accepted Christ as my Savior and have been baptized, my walk with him has taken a back seat over the years. I also realized that by me not making this a priority, I have not been teaching my kids about God and teaching them to walk with him. One day in the van on the way to or from an activity for one of them, we were talking about your progress and also what happens to people when they die. I answered their questions and let them know that only the, the only way to heaven is to accept Jesus in your heart, believe in him, and they would be saved. I told them any time they could pray and do this, it didn't have to be at church. A few minutes later, I looked up in the rearview mirror, and my two oldest, 10 and 8, had their heads bowed, their hands clasped, and were praying. In that moment, they were asking him to be their savior. I know I have not lived a perfect life and have made mistakes, but God loves me just the same. I apologize for the long and rambling note, but Mr. Campice, I know beyond a doubt that God spoke directly to my heart through your illness. My walk with God is getting back to where it needed to be. I am listening, growing, and turning the control of my life back over to him. 
I'm talking with my kids about our Lord and the wonderful, wonderful things he has to offer. I had hoped to talk with you on Friday at the pageant when I saw you, but did not get the opportunity. I know my daughter, Samantha, would love to meet you. Friday, I pointed out to her that you were the, at the pageant, and her eyes lit up. He's really getting better, isn't he, she said to me. When you walked out on stage during the cardboard testimonials, her eyes lit up. She smiled so big and clapped so loud. Through this, she got to witness the power of prayer, the coming together of God's people, and the absolute wonderful, wonderful miracles he does. You and your family are still in our thoughts and prayers daily. Be blessed and have a wonderful day. Heather McCallan. You guys asked for a miracle. God gave you a miracle. Not only did God spare my life, but he saved a little girl through this. You asked that God would be glorified, and God is glorified in this. I met this family on Friday in my office. Garrett, the father, Heather, the mother, Samantha, who's 10, Zach, who's 8, and Ashley, who's sick. The kids also told me the ages of their parents, but I'm not going to share you with that with you. <laughs> They're a great family. Their kids have been involved in Awana here. Seeds have been planted all along here. And God saw fit to use my sickness to d draw this young lady to himself. And I'm going to ask the McCallum family if they'd stand. I'm going to ask Samantha if you'd make your way up here. Come on up, Samantha. <laughs> this is my buddy Samantha who's been praying for me. One of many. Samantha, you want to tell them what, what you did in the back of the van that day and what Jesus has done for you? I asked, um, me and my brother prayed for him to um, come into our hearts so we could get to heaven. Amen. People ask what, have I, what I have learned. Yeah, he's changed, he looks different, he's lost some weight. I've learned this, I have only one body and I need to take care of it. I'm supposed to take care of it. I need to do that. I've also learned how tru truly humbling it is when you find out that people really, really are praying for you. Uh, it, it is so humbling. People say, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. But when you find out that they really, really are praying for you, it's absolutely humbling. You prayed me out of heaven. Thank you. <laughs> I say we spend more time praying people out of heaven than we do praying them into heaven. But thank you for praying me out of heaven. And then I learned this. I've learned that my wife's love for me is beyond my understanding, uh, beyond my comprehension. I learned how much my kids really love me. They said that uh, if I survive 5% of survival, that I would have some complications. I'm doing fine, but they think I do have some complications. <laughs> and then... Uh, I, uh, what God has taught me through all this is I've learned the reality of what I have taught for years. And that is, first of all, that God is in control. That he always, he, he knows my needs. That he is surprised by nothing. That he loves me. That he always does what is right. And that his timing is absolutely perfect. I've uh, had the opportunity of living that over the last three months. And I'm so grateful for what you guys have done for our family. I say thank you, thank you, thank you from all of us. And this here, I, I had the opportunity this morning to introduce to you one of our new sisters in Christ, Samantha. You can stay here for a minute. Let's pray and thank God for what he has done and what he continues to do. Father, we come before you this morning um, humbled ourselves. God, we, we talk often here of, of your sovereignty. We, we heard this morning, you are in control, that you are greater and bigger than 
than anything out there and that nothing shocks you, nothing surprises you. So when Jerry fell sick that January, you weren't caught off guard wondering what to do and trying to pick up the pieces, but God, you were in complete control with even this Easter Sunday in mind, knowing exactly how these pieces were going to fit together. So God, we, we talk of your sovereignty often, but how sweet it is to experience it and to see it and, and to find us completely and totally dependent and trusting in you. Um, so God, we thank you for that. As difficult as it was for, for us as a church and, and, and multiplied even more the difficulty that for Jerry and his family to go through that, but God, I, I guarantee you they, they would stand here and say that, that you are so much sweeter to them now through this trial and enduring this, that you're so much more real. So God, we thank you for those moments and pray that we would continue to be a, a people of God that rests in you, that depends on you, that trusts in you. And God, we, we thank you so much that you did save Jerry's life, but even more than that, we're so thankful that you saved Samantha and her brother's life. God, as much as we and Jerry joked at the end prayed him out of heaven, it, it, it would have been far better for him to be in the presence of God. So, but, but God, we thank you for that salvation. Thank you for saving. But God, we thank you so much that you have saved Samantha and her brother and what you're doing in the life of their family. God, that's what we even celebrate even more. God, that you are a God that saves, that loves, that came down 2,000 years ago to die for us, and then we celebrate 2,000 years later today that you are not in that grave, but you are alive and risen, and we have life in your name. So God, that's what we celebrate, and that's what we worship you for. And so God, as we continue in this time of, of celebration, as we sing the song, Oh, Happy Day, God, may this be something that isn't just words that we sing, but man, just an attitude of our life and of our heart of just an overwhelming thankfulness and gratitude to the God who saves. We love you. It's all for your name. We ask it. Amen. There's a song that's kind of a standard around Easter time. Let's stand together and let's sing Up From The Grave He Arose. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph
At this point, we're going to take our fellowship break here. So if you are visiting with us, this is the time where the kids go now to the Calvary Kids Ministry. And so uh, if you don't know where to go, you go right out these doors here. This is all kids up through fifth grade. Go out these doors, follow the sign. There'll be a Calvary Kids volunteer at the top of the steps to show you where the kids are going. So we're going to take a five-minute break here where kids can be dismissed. The rest of you, go say hi to someone you don't know. Welcome them to Calvary. I can't believe the summer is almost here. I'm looking forward to the warmer weather and the change of pace. We've got some great things planned for the summer, and we believe God is going to do something special in us and through us during these summer months. Sunday nights during the summer are all about building community. We've got three main ways we're hoping to accomplish it. So first, we're going to devote a couple of Sunday nights to teaching on community. What is community? Why is it important? Why does God want us to focus on it? Secondly, we've got some fun things planned for Up at the Acres, picnics, ice cream sundaes, movies, maybe even a concert. All things that will help us talk, laugh, and grow together. Finally, and most importantly, every other Sunday night we're going to have in-home fellowships. Nothing helps build community like eating with other Christians in their home. So people will be able to sign up to go over to someone's house or to host a family or two. We're going to have some get to know you questions for discussion. It's going to be a great time. People will be shocked at how deeply they'll connect with others just through the simple act of eating together. We see this all the time in the life of Jesus. All through the Gospels, Jesus is eating with people in their homes. When God came as a man, he went from house to house, eating, laughing, and loving others. That's an example I'm glad to follow. We are building community all summer long. It's going to be great. I can't wait. All right, let's stand and let's sing again together. I'm going free.
Luke 24 says, but on the first day of the week, at the early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you that while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all the things to the eleven and to all the rest. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful today that we can take a day aside and remember that you're not dead, that you are the risen Savior, and that we serve a risen Lord. We are thankful for our salvation, for our redemption. We're thankful for your sovereign hand. We pray, God, that you be honored now in the service. Bless the rest of it. And Josh, as he preaches, we pray that Jesus Christ would be glorified. Meet the need. And if there's some here that have never trusted you as Savior, we pray today to be their day of salvation. We love you and thank you for the day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yay! Okay. 